Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce Ray McKenzie. Mr. McKenzie, thank you so much to be with us tonight. No, thank you for having me, Richard. Um, thank you and the team for uh, inviting me to speak and, and kind of share some information I've learned throughout my career journey. We fully appreciate your participation to the, tonight with us. All right, sounds good. Um, so should, do you want me to kind of go ahead and get started? Of course, you can start. All right, sounds good. So my name is Ray McKenzie. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Starting Point. Um, Starting Point is a software as a service, uh, customer operations and experience platform for service-based companies and teams. Uh, and then I'm also the founder and managing director of Red Beach Advisors. Red Beach Advisors is a technology management consulting firm um, with the principles of foc being focused on strategy, operational efficiency, and digital transformation through technology for Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, Global 2000 companies. Um, kind of my, my journey itself into leadership for the most part started, gosh, I, I'd say, you know, directly out of college, I, I joined an early stage startup in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley. Um, and, you know, through that time period, I was a very early stage employee with the company, um, I'd say number 18 to be exact. Over the course of the next four to five years, um, when I joined the when I joined the company, I, I actually was a solo person running all of the service delivery for the company itself. So that meant any customers that were on the platform, um, anybody we had sold services for, anything like that was actually coming directly to me. And uh, interesting about that is it was a twenty four seven company. And so we only, we didn't have a lot of funding. We didn't have um, a lot of resources. We definitely didn't have a lot of people. And so I was kind of the person you reached 24 seven within the business. Um, and so in doing that over the course of the next four years, the company actually grew exponentially. And so with it growing exponentially, what we were able to do is, you know, hire people. And that's really how I got my first foray into leadership of a team. Um, I was able to, you know, one, start with one person, then it went from one person to two people. And then, you know, my team eventually over the course of the next four years grew to 40, 50 people full time around the world. Um, then we went through an acquisition with a publicly traded company out of Washington, D.C. So things were, you know, moving very fast. And I was very, very young in my career. Um, what I attribute to kind of some of the leadership principles I used during that time in my career was really watching a lot of the other people I worked with. Um, I worked with a lot of fantastic people. Um, they were really smart. Um, we're still very close to this day. Um, and some of the principles that I learned early on was the first one was always kind of relate to your employees in some form or fashion. So regardless of where they come from, everybody comes from different backgrounds. Everybody comes from different experiences. Um, one of the things I learned was always find that one connection point with everybody that's on your team. And so what I did was I, I really would sit down with people and just really try to get them to get to know them as people, not necessarily employees, not necessarily just people that were within the department, but really have a conversation with them to find out, hey, what do you do after work? Or what do you like to do outside of the office? Or, you know, where's your family? Or what are your hobbies? And so for every person that was on my team, I learned how to kind of communicate with them as just a person that was more of a friend or somebody who just knew them um, off the street, somebody that they would relate to. And so that always opened up the lines of communication for me to work directly with them, okay? Um, and then as we went forward, um, kind of leading that team in my career, uh, over the next four and a half years, my team grew to about 500 people full time. Okay, so then it grew from was one person in an organization to about 500 people in multiple different locations. Um, with that, you know, you have a lot of different lessons um, because then at that point, I'm not the direct supervisor for everybody, but I'm also working with managers who I've hired, directors who I've hired, senior directors I've hired, team leads that I've hired. And so, it, you know, for that organization, 
a lot of the things that I did early on when my organization was 10 people, 20 people, those same principles don't necessarily apply to when you are, you know, 400, 500 people within your organization in different office locations. So, uh, you know, the principles are very different. You know, how you communicate with everybody is very different. You're not always in charge of all of the hiring decisions. You're not always able to sit down with everybody and find something unique about them. But just as I was able to early on in my career develop the ways for communication in singular communication one-to-one -one with people on the team, I was able to then develop other ways to communicate and develop relationships with other people in the department and in my company. And that was focused around, you know, newsletters. That was focused around um, sharing values and sharing those messages through your management um, and making sure that everybody within the organization also always had the ability to share ideas. Okay. And so as a leader, I really wanted to always communicate with my team, whether it was a small team or whether it's a large team, giving them the ability to share their voice, share ideas and concepts that can help them, or share feedback from what they're doing on their day to day job. Fast forward in my career, I was at that company, New Star, for another four and a half years. I then moved over to another company named Veristein. Um, who was also in Washington, D.C. And my team at Verisign ended up after, you know, moving over there, ended up being about a team of 30 to 40 individuals um, in multiple different locations. And so, you know, the, the topic of this conversation is how to lead and take those some of those leadership principles across various size teams. And I think kind of the one piece that you always want to take is communication whenever you're leading a team. You want to communicate well with either your direct reports and have them trickle that down to your entire staff or everybody in your organization. You know, that's one thing you want to do. So, you know, whether I travel from San Francisco and I was in Seattle within the office, I would go by and talk to my team there. Whether I was in San Diego, I would go by and talk to them there. Whether I was in London, I would go out and talk to them there, shake their hand, have a little bit of conversation with them. Um, you know, and then from there at, at Verisign, it was kind of a smaller team. It was, we had to execute, we had to move things forward. So communication was much easier because of what's a much smaller team. However, it was um, a bit of a challenge because we had multiple products, we had multiple services and multiple people in the business did other things. And we did kind of have a dotted line to other organizations in the business. So there was a bit of a challenge with communication and structuring messages and things like that. But for the most part, you know, it's all about talking to your team and managing them in the right direction. The next item that, you know, the next place I went was a company hired me to move to Los Angeles, where I'm at now, and we're based in Redondo Beach, as um, I was leading global strategy and service delivery for them. And so my travels now at this point to where I was going from San Francisco to Washington, DC, I was now going from Los Angeles to Belgrade, Serbia, to Munich and Frankfurt, to London, to LA once a month. And so I had a lot of staff and working with a lot of customers and working with a lot of clients and leading service delivery and global strategy for them. And so things were, you know, always relatively in terms of the term team dynamic, we worked relatively well together throughout the different offices. Kind of a part of leadership when you have teams and distributed teams and you, you know 24 seven responsibility and very high profile customers. And at this point, working with companies like Microsoft, Twitter, Salesforce, Google, uh, you know, you got to make sure everybody on your team plays the right role. And that's something that, you know, I learned early on, but also in this company, it was extremely important because you have certain people on your team that are responsible for certain customers or certain amount of revenue or certain responsibilities. And so it, while communication is a big piece of it, also role assignment is another big piece of it. You know, so when you start taking a look at the people that are on your team and what role they play on your team, you want to make sure they're playing a role that is strong for them. You know, not necessarily where you want to put somebody who's weak 
and put them in a role with somebody like a Google or a Microsoft or a Twitter, you want to put somebody strong in those positions, understand their strengths, understand their weaknesses, understand where you can coach them and move them up. So the first principle is communication. The second principle is making sure role assignment is correct in leadership. You know, put people in positions to win and be successful. Because in any company you're at, in any leadership role you're at, you want to make sure the people that are in those roles or in those positions feel good about what they're doing. They feel confident about what they're doing. They know you're, they're able to execute at what they're doing. And then that makes your job as a leader that much easier. Okay. Then as we come back, you know, uh, I was at that company for another year and a half here in Los Angeles. And, it, you know, one of the things that we would do is, or that I started to implement was, really a four-pronged approach to interviewing people. You know, I'd let people come in, tell me about themselves, share their background, share their experience. But I would always go to them and end with four questions, you know, at every interview, you know, tell me three strengths that you have. You know, as, as a person, as an employee, or, you know, as a person who's interviewing, you should know what your strengths are. You know, know what you're good at. I think that's a that's a very big thing, and be very. Be, this all lends towards self awareness. Then talk of give me two weaknesses, two areas professionally that you feel that you can improve upon, because if you're able to share those two weaknesses or areas you can improve, um, that lets whoever's going to hire you know how they can coach you, or how to put you in the right position. You know, if you are a, to a sports analogy, if you are, um, you know, if you're 5'5 five five and you can handle the ball well, you know, you're a probably not a, a weakness of yours is probably blocking shots in basketball. But a strength is dribbling the basketball. So by me telling the coach, hey, I can handle the ball really well the coach was probably going to put me at the point guard position instead of putting me at the center position. You know, or, you know, hey, I could be 6'11 and I can handle the basketball and I may not be good at blocking shots, but hey, maybe the coach can help teach me how to do that. And so as a role of a leader is not only communicating with your team, not only role assignment, but also coaching your team to improve and knowing what they're good at and what they're not good at and understanding how they feel about what they're good at and what they're not good at. I've seen a lot of examples of leaders that go in and say, hey, you know, I don't think you're good at this. And the employee will come back and say, well, you've never given me a chance to show you I can do this. Or you've never asked me if I could do this. And a big part of that is, you know, just asking your employees or your team members, what do you think you're good at? How can you help this organization? And so I ask people strengths, weaknesses. I ask them to tell me kind of uh, two personal achievements that are outside of work in terms of things they like to work on. And then I always ask for a strange fact about them, you know, to try to get them to open up a little bit. But really as a leader, those are kind of the three principles you really want to follow. You know, communicate with your team. We see it every day in all types of companies. You know, we'll see employees that say, we never knew what was going on within the company. We see bosses that just don't talk or don't communicate with their team or their employees well. Um, we see people who are in roles, the incorrect roles within businesses that don't take advantage of strengths or even know what their true job is. We also see people that are just not utilizing their strengths within organizations to the fullest. And to have successful organizations, you really need to understand those strengths and weaknesses of your team. And then as a leader, our job is to coach individuals to get them better. You know, so if they're strong at a, a position, you want to put them in a role to, to accentuate their strengths. However, you want to understand what they're not good at, because if you understand what they're not good at, then you can possibly coach them up to be better at what they're not good at. And then you've, you've built a well-rounded person on your team 
that can either become a leader in your team, or they can be a leader somewhere else in the business, or they can is, you know, start new initiatives within your division in your department. And those are the people that you want to rely upon. You know, unfortunately, in my career, I've been able to work with fantastic people. Um, I've been able to work with amazing people that have been able to be coached. Um, and they've gone on to have great careers either with me or with other companies. Um, you know, and it's worked out relatively well. And now, you know, I'd say six years ago, I started my own firm, Red Beach Advisors, which is a technology management consulting firm um, focused on strategy, operational efficiency, and digital transformation through technology. And with that, I'm usually going into these Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies and really assessing a lot of different items within the business. It's a combination of strategy. It's a combination of you know, process and procedure. It's a combination of technology, but it really does come down to personnel too, which is who are the people that are going to be able to execute across those three pillars? And do you have the right people in those organizations to do it? You know, If you don't have somebody who is a strong project manager, you know, but you want somebody who's a project manager, you need to go out and find and fill that gap with the person. You always have to find people who can solve the challenges within organizations or none of those pillars are going to work well. You know, none of those cogs in the wheel are going to move forward. Um, and so you, you people is, is essential to that. And then as we go into organizations, we're always looking at, you know, what's the direction? What's the strategy? What's, who's leading the organization? And sometimes that's, and sometimes that's a gap. Sometimes that's a weak point, unfortunately. Sometimes people, you go into these large organizations and we think, gosh, there could be no problems that are going on at the Amazons of the world or the Teslas of the world or some of these others. And what occurs is, they have a lot of the same challenges too. You know, they've, they've got the same challenges that companies that are three to five to 10 people have, you know, which is people run the show at the end of the day. And so you have to have the right people in the right positions that know what they're doing, who have those strengths to run and move the business division, the initiative, the project, um, the people forward. And that's a big challenge. I mean, and, you know, it, we go in and we see it with these large companies. Um, we see it with the small companies. Um, leadership is something that not everybody is, a, is, is it, it doesn't come natural to everybody. Um, you know, you, it, it, nobody comes out and says, I'm a leader, you know, right off the bat. You know, and you you also have to, being a leader doesn't just say, hey, you kids can't come out and say, I'm a leader. You also have the people that report up to you or work with you, look at you in that same fashion. So it goes this both ways. And a lot of that is respect too. You know, so if you treat people well and you give them right direction and you're clear with them and you communicate well with them and you put them in positions to succeed, more than likely they're going to work with you going forward and try to have success with you. And that's very, very important because I've seen organizations as well to where somebody comes in and says, I'm the, I'm the leader, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And it doesn't go over well because they don't tell people, they don't communicate well, or they haven't put team members in the right position to be successful. You know, and so those are some of the things that, you know, I've seen as, as a leader of companies. Now, going forward, um, you know, I, I kicked off, I've started Starting Point. Starting Point is a software as a service startup, very different than a professional services or consulting firm. Um, you know, we built software. Um, so it's different from a consulting firm. It's just different. It's very, very different. I mean, just the application, the support of customers, how it's run from an operational perspective. Um, some things stay the same, some things don't. You know, we've got to develop pricing models. We've got to develop marketing schemes. We've got to develop strategies. We've got to evaluate competitive analysis. And then we've got a team to do so. You know, and we've got a team right now of nine. Um, three of us are full-time, six are part-time. Um, Luckily, the people that are part-time, I've actually been able to work with 
um, throughout my career. And so I leveraged a lot of the individuals I worked with across these, these companies through the past 20 years, and I've rolled them into starting point. And they're people that I trust, they're people I communicate with, um, and I, I, I aim to always put them in positions that they're comfortable in or that they're strong at. Um, and with that, you know, um, being a leader of a, of a, uh, of a tech, tech startup is very different. Um, you know, the job is intensive because we, I share a lot with them, you know, and we all have a lot of different roles we have to play in the business. You know, when, if you decide to go work at a Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 company, they're going to bring you in to do one job and do that one job really well. Whereas if you come down to a tech startup that is under 10 people, you're going to have to play multiple roles. And so the skill set, and that goes back to roles, the skill set that you look for for somebody in a company where you have multiple roles to play is very different than a large company to where you're going to have to work with, work with one specific person, one specific team and be very good at that position. So understand that, you know, I'd say as you move forward in your careers, you wanna go and understand what you're getting yourself into. And some of the people you interview with, some of the people you talk to, some of the people you, you know, get information about, um, when you're talking to the companies, ask those questions, which are, hey, how big is the organization? And who else will I be working with? And what type of people succeed in the role that you have me, you know, trying to undertake? Um, those are all things that you'll want to know going into a role. Some people I've met in my career are absolutely amazing at one specific role, one specific job, and can execute upon that day after day after day. Then I know people who can multitask and be very strong at many different areas of what they're good at. You know, and they're two, there's not to say one isn't better than the other, it's just, depends on the role that they're put in. It all depends on the role that they're put in. You know, if I, uh, you know, Alexis is a project manager. Um, say if I need him to not only be the project manager, but I also need him to be 24 seven knock, but I also need him to be, you know, a Linux administrator, but I also need him to um, possibly write marketing copy. Um, he, he may just be well in one position, may not be well in all of them. You know, but in certain organizations, I can say, Alexis, you're great. I need a project manager specifically for this project working with Wells Fargo, and he'll be able to execute it nonstop and do well. And so, you know, kind of the core principles I, I go back to, you know, communication is extremely important with your team and being a leader, you know, talk to your team, communicate with them, um, understand them, develop relationships with them understand the roles that you need within your organization. Okay, that's extremely important and be able to explain that to other people, you know, what they need to do. And then evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of the people within your team. Because as the leader, you're responsible for putting people in passive success. Okay, that's your job as a leader to drive success. And I'll pass it back to you, Alexis. Wow, this is really cool. Because like, um, I'm just listening into it. I'm like, there's a lot of um, understanding in people from what I'm hearing. You have to understand people. Um, really cool, Ray. Um, yeah, so let me just transition into um, pretty much the things that are going to come up. We're going to actually have a launch party at uh, the CSUDH campus. Oh, not the campus, but, you know, the, um, the Zoom. Uh, uh, event, but it's going to be all uh, CSUDH um, based. Um, really cool stuff coming up. So um, in this launch party, we're pretty much going to have a lot of um, introductions of the CSUDH uh, chapter. Um, so the university will kind of introduce themselves and then we'll get into um, a networking event. So uh, you'll be able to really network with these great, amazing people. Um, just really lucky to be around these people. Um, and yeah, um, you know, this is going to be on the 19th. Don't miss it. And we will transition to Q&As.
And here I encourage everyone to ask any type of question to our amazing speaker. Any concern, this is your opportunity. Don't be shy and do not come at once as our CEO will say. <laughs> No question. If you guys don't want to go first, I'll go first. It's okay. Um, and then we'll just go by like that. Um, just me to keep it going, unless somebody's somebody's kind of come in. No? Okay, cool, cool, cool. So um, Ray, my question to you is, you know, um, coming from a very, uh, very logic based numbers, you know, um, systematic um, point, uh, I mean, um, you know, uh, area, is it difficult to, um, or um, is it difficult to kind of, um, you know, have have the um, very like the human portion of of um, talking to people? Is it because I know like for me like I, I like numbers. I like you know specific uh, systems in play, and I'm very you know for me personally, I've I, I've you know I've had engineering background as well, so I know what it's like to just want to get things done and it's very cutthroat and, and whatnot how how has that been in that technology field gosh i'd say you know one of the things i've always i'd say is a natural attribute of mine which everybody doesn't have is and i'll, I'll give you a book if you're if you're kind of more of a more aligned with numbers and logic and things like that is emotional intelligence you know and a, a lot of people don't I won't say a lot of people, I'll say some people just don't have what that is and understand really what that is. And so for, for those of us who are, you know, very numbers-based, logic-based, you know, explanatory, you know, um, things like that, we look at things from a completely different lens. Like, hey, give me this task, let me just get this done. Um, you know, the numbers are what the numbers are, this is the logic, this is the best way to get things done. Whereas some people that think like that lack what is called emotional intelligence. Um, and so you've seen there's some books out there focused around it and a book that you know I've read is, uh, it's actually called Emotional Intelligence 2.0 and that's by Gene Graves. And so with that, you know, it teaches people how to be self-aware, how to develop relationships with other people um how to communicate with other people um how to understand how other people function you know as part of a team and a leaders really need to have the emotional intelligence and because you're hiring people or you're leading people from all different types of backgrounds and all different types of skill sets and all different types of ways that they communicate differently and also draw different drivers for what motivates them to get their job done. You know, somebody may say, hey, my driver for getting my job done is, you know, I really in, you know, in five to 10 years, I or seven to 10 years, I want to be a vice president of a company. So that's my driver to coming to work every day and moving forward. You know, and then you can have somebody in your team who's like, my driver for getting stuff done is I just want to make sure I am able to retire from this job in the next three years. Those are completely two different sets of aspirational goals, you know? And then so you can have somebody on your team who's like, hey, I know I'm going to be here for a year, 18 months. I just want to block and tackle and execute and get things done and go on to the next role. And so everybody's driver in, in work is a little different. And so you do have to understand that relationships, awareness of people on your team and develop that. And so if you don't really understand or what you can say in an easy way, if you can't read the room, read that book, Emotional Intelligence 2.0. You know, so be able to understand facial expressions, moods, tones, how's the best way to communicate with specific people? How's the best way to always be respectful? you know, how to convey your message properly to people in organizations, you know, and for people that are very logic based, you know, we want to go up and we just want to say, this is the project, this is the task, this is when we need to get it done by, 
this is what you're responsible for. Go get that done. Everybody doesn't respond to that in that fashion. And so you really, sometimes people need more, hey, Emmanuel, I need you to be, you know, we really need you on the team. We, you're re really valuable. We need, you know, you to contribute and do well. You know? and, and some people need that coaching. Some people need that pat on the back. Some people need that encouragement. Whereas other people who you can say, hey, Richard, here you go, go get this done. Richard will take it and just go. He doesn't need you to tell him, hey, do a great job. And you see that all the time in, in different organizations. You'll see it all the time. You know? And so I, I think that's, that's something that can definitely help you as kind of growing leaders is to understand the importance of emotional intelligence with people and how to communicate that and how to work with different people who, who have different skills in terms of that and leadership and communication. It's, it's, it's extremely, extremely important, but it doesn't only lead to just leadership within companies. It's actually anything in terms of kind of your career as a whole. You know, as you move forward in your career, you're going to be talking to rooms of people you're going to need to, you know, understand is what I'm saying interesting? Is what I'm saying not interesting? Do I need to crack a joke? Or is right now not a good time to crack a joke? You know, all of those things lend towards the intelligence of the emotions and seeing how other people react to what you do. Okay. Um, I think we've got a question from Steve who says, I, I mentioned, you mentioned about knowing your own strengths and weaknesses. What are some ideas as to how to figure out our strengths if we are not sure ourselves? So, you know, I think for people who don't understand what they're good at, you know, I, I go through, there's a, there's a couple of different ways in which you can do so, okay? Um, the first thing I like to ask people who don't know what their strengths are, and I've sat with people, college students, high school students, and they come back and say, well, I don't know what I'm good at. You know, I'm kind of good at this. I'm kind of good at that. I, I don't really like this. I don't really like that. Um, what, I've, what I've tried to do is with those individuals, I go back and I say, what are things that you've done that turned out really well? And sometimes it's not about the direct question. It's sometimes it's how you phrase the question to get people to think about what's going on. You know, and so I'll say, tell me an example of something that you've done that turned out extremely well, either in your career, in college, in sports, in whatever it may be. Tell me about that experience. And then I'll say, give me another example. And they'll come out with another example. And then usually as a, as a leader or a coach of people, you'll be like, okay, so you're really good at this. You know, you're really good at making this happen. You know, you can say, okay, great. Yeah, somebody can say, well, you know, I, I once upon a time I made this, you know, uh, spaghetti dish and people loved it. Okay, that's great. Okay, and then they'll say, well, also this other time I made this dish that was, you know, maybe a, a, a fried rice and it didn't turn out well. You'd be like, okay. And then they'll be like, well, another time I did make a lasagna and it turned out really well. Okay, well, maybe your strength is cooking Italian food, but maybe you need to stay away from Chinese food. And then they're able to say, oh, you're right. That is a strength of mine. So sometimes just questions and answers work out relatively well. Now there's other methodologies too. So, um, and I've used multiple uh, ways of this. And, and so something to take back as a group to research are kind of these different um, behavioral assessments or personality assessments, you know? And so there's a few of them. Um, there's DISC, D-I-S-C, um, which is a popular method that you'll see out in kind of the corporate world. Um, you'll also see Insights, which is another way. And I actually threw, I think that was born from Microsoft. Or you'll also see another item called um, predictive index. Um, and they're all kind of behavior and personality assessments. And so um, I try to stay away from one that's called Myers-Briggs. Um, it's pretty old. It has its own inherent biases as part of it. And that's kind of scientifically proven. 
but you'll want to research some of those. Those are always good as well. So if you want some scientific way to try to figure out who's good for a specific type of role, these tests can help do that. I won't say that they're the 100% way of doing it, but they can contribute positively towards the selection of a right person. Okay, and what they are do, what they what they are, they're kind of quick tasks you can take, maybe 40, 50 question test that um, allows somebody to really share what they're strong at or what they're weak at. And so they'll give responses based on the test. And then the methodology will then spit out kind of where people are strong, what people are not strong at, what people tend to lean towards or what they tend to shy away from. And so when you take a look at the position you want, so say if I'm hiring for a sales position, for example, I'm going to, I, and I've got somebody for a sales position, I want to run them through maybe a behavior or personality assessment to kind of see what their skill sets are. You know, because when you interview people, they're always going to tell you put on their best face, always, 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 which is why they're interviewing. And so when you give them this behavior assessment, personality test, it will tell you if they're perfect for the role or not. Like if you're hiring a salesperson that's not necessarily an extrovert, that doesn't lend towards them being very strong at that role. However, if I'm hiring a database engineer who doesn't have to work with any external customers and they're an introvert, they may be perfect for that specific role, especially if they like to do it. So those tests kind of help me kind of figure out where people are truly strong um, and, and just in regular conversation, but along pairing that with some of the assessments, personality, behavior assessments, things like that. Amazing, any more questions guys? Cool, we got a VD, VD's over here. She's got one question. So she says, what or who got you into leadership? Uh, let's see, let me pull it up. How does someone gain emotional intelligence? You know, what What got me into leadership? Oh, gosh, I think I was, I was thrust into it at that kind of early stage role with that company. Um, kind of the company was, uh, so the story was I joined the company in November. My boss at the time was there for two weeks. He was saying, here's a book. And it was a binder of about 500 pages. And he was like, this is kind of what can help you do your job. I've got to go. My wife is having a baby. Um, bye. And so he left two weeks after I started my job. And so I was thrust into being the only person in my department. From there, I learned everything about you know the department I was leading. So then um, I, I then that position kind of led into, hey, we need to then scale other roles and you know bring in other people to do things within the department. And so that's really how my corporate leadership career started was I started to really work and communicate and talk to people and, and guide them and try to put them in positions to be successful. You know, my all my principle is always try to put people in positions of success as much as possible, okay? Um, and, and so in, in leadership and how I kind of had examples of that, you know, I've used a lot of sports analogies this evening. Um, I watch a lot of sports. I've played a lot of sports, um, played on a lot of teams. Uh, and so that kind of always was an example for me to see some of those leaders um, on, on a regular basis. So, and then just that is really what I can say is throughout my career, I've been able to watch and observe people. So watching and observing people and seeing how what works and what doesn't work is more important than probably, you know, trying to do it yourself for the most part. You know, watch and learn from other people of higher stature, who you're close to. Um, who you can see perform on a regular basis and just see what works and what doesn't work and take note of that as much as you can, okay? And then to your second question about how does someone gain emotional intelligence? You know, it's, you know, you can, like I said, you can read that that book is definitely helpful. 
Um, but I, I say emotional intelligence comes with being aware to look and read the room in terms of faces, tones, and responses. And pain and having the intelligence to pay attention to those things. Like some people will, and I'm sure all of you have done this or seen this, which is you decide to go to a conference or a speech or something's going on and a person just talks and 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 talks more. It could be on a date. It could be, you know, a coworker. It could be somebody on the phone and you're just sitting on the other end like, dude, oh my gosh, like what is going on? Like, I would interrupt, but this person hasn't given me a second to talk or I, I, they don't understand, hey, maybe it'd be good to just give somebody a chance to chime in. They just talk and talk and talk. Those are people that can't read the room for the most part. You know, you want to be able to engage, see if people are paying attention, see if people are listening, see if people are giving you feedback, see what their, what their, um, what their body habits are like or body stature is like. You know, if somebody's sitting there like this with their hand on their chin, it's kind of like they're pro they possibly are not interested. But if they're sitting up and paying attention and they're like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. I like what they're saying. That lets you know that, hey, I'm paying attention to what the room is doing. And you really just want to open yourself up to that. Start watching faces, watching, you know, stature, watching behaviors, watching eyes, watching feedback. Those are things that you'll understand are extremely important. Like one thing we've seen is, you know, when in, in starting point, one of the challenges we had was obviously our messaging of our product. It's a challenge. But what we've been able to do is we went back and interviewed our customers and our prospects and we ran messaging by them. And we really just, and granted in a time of COVID, it was difficult, but we were able to do video conferencing and so when I said certain key words, their eyes would light up. That's how I knew we had hit something that made sense. Versus somebody who's like, I, they're just blank staring in the sky. I don't have no idea what service delivery is. We have no idea what customer operations are. We have no idea. But when we say we've built software for non-technical business leaders, they're like, oh yeah, that's me. That lights up. You know, and so the paying attention to those reactions from people, faces, tones, how they're talking to you, you know, body language, that's all part of the emotional intelligence. And then understanding that, you know, people are human at the end of the day. Um, I think as a leader, you always want to hold that close. You know, we're in a time now that accentuates, that accelerates all of that. You know, we've got family members that are sick. We've got friends that are sick. We've got people going through different things, whether it be financially, emotionally, you know, economically, whether it's, you know, health, it's all this stuff that's going on. And empathy is a big, is a big thing, you know, and understand that other people are human too. And that lends towards having those emotions and understanding your team or the people that you lead. That's awesome, Ray. Um, thank you so much for your advice. I feel like I've learned so much already. And I would like to ask you, uh, what are some habits you practice personally that helps you develop your leadership and your personal development? Um, I uh, One thing is I try to, uh, I guess my personal development I guess when people tell me a book, I go get it and read it. Um, one of the things I've learned is probably 95% of the things you want to know is probably in a book. So if somebody tells you, hey, this is a great book, go buy the book and read the book, okay? Um, or other things I like to do in terms of, you know, I, 
in terms of leadership, it's all about talking and developing relationships with people. Like, um, I, I try to talk to people as much as possible and get to know their motivating drivers. Like what's important to you is very different than what's important to me. So I can't talk to you or lead you in the direction that I would lead myself. I need to lead you in the direction that's beneficial for you. Okay, and a lot of that comes with the first principle communication, you know, which is just, hey, let's talk, let's get to know each other, let's, you know, let me find out what motivates you, what your driver is, what your short term goals are, what your long term goal is. And then me as a leader is my job to get you there. And that's really it, you know, if you want to be, um, you know, the next person you want to be is maybe the White House press secretary in 2022. Then my job is to put you in a position to where you're you're speaking to people on a public basis on a regular basis all the time. And you're getting exposure to do that on a regular basis and that's your driver. And so whether it's a job with me or whether it's a job with the White House, my job is to prepare you to do that. You know, and so that's, those are some of the things that I, I try from a, from a leadership perspective is just to communicate and practice communicating, practice talking to people, um, practice listening to people, um, which is another principle that, you know, I haven't really touched on, but that's part of communication. But listening as a leader is very, 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 very important. You know, listen to your team, communicate with your team, put them in positions of success, understand their strengths and weaknesses, understand the roles you need, and then you can move the chess pieces around the board as you need to. Oh, thank you, um, Ray. And I see Steve put up the Emotional Intelligence 2.0 book. And since you brought up the topic, what are some books you will recommend for everyone here to read? Um, gosh, let's see. Um, this one right here, um, Patrick Lencioni, um, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team and Overcoming Those. Um, that's a fantastic book. Uh, another book that I think is great, where's that? Um, that's focused primarily around leadership of people. This book here called The Leadership Pipeline is fantastic. Um, and also, where is that? Where is that? Where is that? Where is that? Um, I think this book is great. This book here is called uh, The Outsiders. And I can give you the link to the book too, but it's by William Thorndike. And it talks about um, CEOs and what their, their kind of different blueprint for success, what worked for them and what didn't work for them. And it talks about eight different ways that they made that happen. Um, and so I, I always try to find books from leaders that, successful leaders, um, leaders that have come from different backgrounds, um, leaders that have led different types of companies and different sizes of companies too. You know, and so, uh, you know, there's, uh, all I can say is if somebody suggests getting a book, get the book and read the book because there's probably something in that book that they want you to know about. That makes sense. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, if nobody has a question, I have one. Hopefully it's not going to be the last one. It is somehow not personal, but I would like you, you know, to think about like the worst uh, controversy that you had or the worst, you know, um, that situation that you had in your life. How do you overcome with that? How do you find, you know, some motivation to yourself or how was, you know, the main 
pike in which you you get out of that you feel me um are you saying kind of are you professionally or personally or in the professional environment yeah let's live in the professional environment the words you know no worse adversity but the adversity that you felt trapped and how do you overcome it um okay so I, i'll tell you this um so the last company i worked for um great company great well great company great people um they had you know kind of sold me on um being innovative you know and you know doing what i call the fun things in corporate career which is be building new products building new services um you know acquiring companies and things like that i was at a stage in my career to where it was like you know, gosh, this this is the stuff I want to do. I want to do the fun things. I've led large organizations. Now I've come back down to a small organization. We need to make this small organization large and have some success. And for that, you know, I, gosh, let's see. It wasn't happening. Uh, it's the company, it wasn't happening at the company I chose. And, you know, it was, it was disappointing. It was one of those things to where it was like, am I motivated to really be at this company? It, it, it's that's not really what I'm in it for, you know? And so I, I went back and really that's a time of self-reflection, which is, okay, I didn't make the right decision. I joined a company um, that sold me on one direction as to where they were going to go. And then now they're not going in a way, what's my next move, you know? And more than likely everybody's going to fall into this scenario at some point. You know, you're going to be you're going to be out of position and you're going to say, well, maybe there's a way up, maybe there's a way sideways, maybe there's a way out of this company, you know. And so for me, I was I battled with it for a bit. I was like, hey, do I want to, you know, do I want to stay here or do I want to go? Um, and it, it was rough because you know, I had great relationships with my team and all that stuff. But at the same time, it was like personally in my career, I needed to needed to make a change. Uh, and so really at that point, I was like, in my career, I look back at my career and I said, hey, if I needed to go get a job, I could go get one. And then I went to, and I'll tell you all this story really quick. I went to lunch in Hermosa Beach here right down the road. And I had flown back from Europe and had lunch and there were a bunch of other people out there Tuesday at one o'clock and I took the day off work and I started talking to them and I said hey you know what do I didn't know, quite know why they were out at Tuesday at one o'clock doing whatever was going on like they had no jobs or nothing was going on I started asking them like hey what do you do for a living and they were like oh well we run our own companies or we do this or we do that or we do this we do that I walked away from that lunch saying hey I think starting my own company is going to be my way out of doing what I want to do, of pursuing kind of my happiness, or at least taking on a new challenge. And a week from there, a week once I said it out loud, um, I got calls from two CEOs that needed my services. And so that's how Red Beach Advisors was actually started. So I kind of took those two opportunities along with my full-time job and worked both for about six months. And then I made the leap. So it was really, you know, how do you get out of a, of a tough situation? Um, start really evaluating all the choices you have professionally and never feel that you don't have any choices. So it's always a, you know, if you've got a tough situation, I've got friends that are like, hey, I'm at this job. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. What do I do? Hey, let's start picking up the phone. Let's start talking to people we know. You know, or let's let's figure this out. Never think you're trapped. Um, I think there's always a way out of the situation or a way to a better path of the situation. And how do I say that is it sometimes it's tough when you're in that situation to kind of go through that and work through that challenge, because all you see is, man, I do not want to go to work today. That's all you, that's all you can say. But at the same time, think about all of the other items that are available. 
you know, and things you can do and start to think out of the box. Like, who can I call? Maybe I need to make a change to another career. Maybe I need to go to this other company. Maybe I just need to go on LinkedIn and apply to 500 jobs tonight and see if my phone rings. So I, I always think the way to kind of get out of situations is really to step back and look at all of your options. You know, like if you're in a house that's burning down and you want to save the house, you can't save the house from inside the house. You step out of the house and start spraying down the house, looking at it from a different angle. And so if you look at something from, if you're trapped in one way, step back, remove yourself from that and start looking at different ways to solve the challenge. You know, and maybe that's, hey, uh, you know, gosh, hey, I hate, uh, gosh, you can say, hey, I've worked at McDonald's for 10 years. And by the way, I worked at McDonald's when I was 15 years old, by the way. So um, I'm working at McDonald's and I hate working at McDonald's okay, well, do I have to go stay at this job or do I have to go only work at McDonald's? No, let me step back. Maybe I can go work at Taco Bell. Okay, that's a move you can make. Or I can go to this other McDonald's around the street or I can go work at Burger King. And by the way, I worked at Taco Bell too when I was in high school. So yeah, I think you always have choices and always take a step back and look at all of the real choices that you have. And if you need someone to, you know, talk to or work through some of those issues, you know, feel free to reach out to me and, you know, I'm always available. I'll always make time. Amazing. Thank you. I appreciate it. Amazing. But yeah. Um, wow. Just thank you so much, Ray, for, for giving us your time and giving us the insight um, of how to, well, really how to escape a matrix if, if we really look down to it, um, if we go down and, and look at it. So, um, you know, thank you for, for giving us um, the knowledge we need to further ourselves. Um, and yeah, um, as far as any updates for EOL goes, uh, again, we're going to have a, an event on the 19th where we are going to um, open up our doors at the CSUDH campus here in California. If you are out of state, you could still um, join in. It's a Zoom meeting and um, we'll have a networking event in there too. So i um, super excited. Um, anything uh, at the end that you would like to say, Ray? Um, no, I left my contact information in, um, in the chat. So feel free to visit, um, feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Um, feel free to reach out to me via email if you ever want to chat or talk about different ideas or ask more questions. Um, I also left the link to my latest company, Starting Point. So feel free to check that out. That'd be great. Um, and definitely feel free to reach out to me if you have questions, if you have, you know, things you're working through, um, things you're working on. Um, I, I always try to make myself available for, you know, young adults and, and people in different careers and and just to kind of build networks and however I can help, you know, feel free to let me know. Amazing. We fully appreciate it. And unfortunately, this is the end of the event. That is the worst part of the day. And besides that it's the seven, I wish you everyone a happy new year. Thank you so much for your collaboration tonight and to make, you know, this platform and EOL something amazing for all leaders all over the world. Hopefully we can expand. And thank you everyone. Thank you all my leaders tonight. We fully appreciate it. Good night. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Every single of you. Have a great, great. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much, Ray.